think we'll go ahead and get started if that's okay with you. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. I am Elitris Niels. I'm the Executive Director of Conservation Catalyst. And you are participating in Conservation Colloquy, which is a transdisciplinary platform for unraveling global problems between people and wildlife. And I'm just going to remind everyone, uh, if you could please uh, mute your microphones when not asking a question um, so we don't get the feedback. Uh, and um, so uh, those of you that are new to Conservation Colloquy, you're in for a real treat. Uh, we have an innovative presentation by an elite world expert that's applicable to participants joining us from around the world. And then it's followed by an informal question and answer period and um, pretty lively discussion. So not only is this on Zoom, but I know many of you are joining us also on Facebook Live. And in addition, it will be recorded and posted on the Conservation Catalyst website. So our objective is to highlight interdisciplinary scientists um, conducting relevant research. And our guest today is all of these things and more. And so uh, as you will see, Dr. Adriana Consorte Matria um, is a conservation biologist that really works at the nexus of many different fields. And she incorporates uh, social science with traditional science and um, also brings in uh, a diversity of members of the public into conservation messaging. In 2017, together with colleagues, she created the Human Wildlife Interactions Working Group in Conservation Translocation with the IUCN, and she chairs that group. And um, she's based at Canterbury Christ Church University, and where she uh, runs an award-winning sustainability education. And uh, she is also our first featured Wonderful Woman of Wildlife, highlighting female conservation leaders and pioneers and promoting diversity in the conservation field. So we're really lucky to have her joining us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Adriana. And um, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much, Electris. It's a pleasure and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be um, a, a wonderful woman of wildlife. Who would have liked that, <laughs> isn't it, title? That's wonderful. I have to live up to the expectations now. <laughs> um, as you said, I'm based at um, Education for Sustainability um, Hub in Christchurch University. And um, I thought I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I came to be where I am. And uh, the, as, you, as you very well introduced, I work with different areas and how that happened. Um, and I'll talk about the human dimensions of uh, conservation translocations and uh, the complexity of working with people and wildlife and um, the different uh, work we've been doing with, with uh, people in Kent and also our working group. Um, okay, so, but the first thing is, is a big, beautiful creature and a beautiful picture just to inspire and start the conversation inspiring. When I was in my last year of university, I studied um, my, my first degree is in, in, in biological sciences and I was studying in, in Brazil, I had an opportunity to do an apprenticeship in um, Sao Paulo Zoo, which is the largest one in, in South America. It's a very good zoo. And uh, it was given me a choice of species and I've chosen to work with the main dwarf. And um, that was in 1986. So the work I did then was looking at um, how um, people were failing, let's see, the, the conservation, the, the captive conservation was failing in Maine Wolf, and there are lots of problems with uh, breeding success. But I just loved having the opportunity to do that. It was my first apprenticeship. 
Um, and then you, to yesterday, I think, it was the seven year uh, anniversary of the launch of my book, Ecology and Conservation of the Maine Wolf, Multidisciplinary Perspectives. So it took a while, but I've been working with Mandel for a long time. I did my PhD on attitudes towards the Mandelwolves in, in Brazil. They are um, a vulnerable species um, and they, their decline has to do with being in the Cerrado environment, which has been turned into soya and cattle ranching. Yeah, A lot of the soya that's imported um, to Europe uh, comes from areas that are uh, biodiversity hotspots like the Cerrado and Mendolf is, is the largest carnivore there. And that's me doing my, my field work with questionnaires. Uh, so, you know, something that you start when you are doing your degree can actually bring you uh, to lots of interesting places. And while I was doing my uh, apprenticeship, apprenticeship in the zoo. I attended this talk, it was a conference on, on um, uh, zoology, and the talk was about something that I never heard of before, it was about reintroduction, about the reintroduction of the golden lion tamarinds to a reserve in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and was an international program in, involved the Smithsonian Institution and the National Zoo in the US and several zoos around the world and um, the Primatology Center in Brazil. And I was so fascinated by the idea that you could actually take animals from the zoo back into the wild. I was very interested in, in uh, conservation in zoos and the role of zoos in conservation then. And, um, uh, and that was my first encounter with reintroduction. I was lucky enough to do an apprenticeship at the Golden Lion Tamarine um, very early on. I did that in 87. And the first reintroductions of the Golden Lion Tamarine happened in 84. Um, there were very few animals in the wild, but there was a population, an international population in captivity, and there was a big program to train animals in captivity to be released. Um, and uh, a lot of the animals that are around today, there is a very a much larger population, uh, came from this zoo born and uh, mixing zoo born with, with the, the, the free living tamarinds. And they're lovely. And the, they, funnily enough, there are Quite a few people who studied the man wolf and the golden lion tamarind. I don't know what the commonalities are. They are both orange. Uh, maybe there's something to do with that. But it's been, it was a fantastic experience. And, and that uh, brought me into the world of reintroduction and uh, learning about the pioneers and the work they've done, like uh, Mark Stanley Price, who is here, one of my heroes. <laughs> so, um, and I went from there to uh, studying the role of uh, behavior in captive, uh, captive conservation and uh, training behavior for reintroduction. That was my master's. And then went into, back to the main door to do my PhD. So from looking at the animal's behaviors in the wild, I just more and more realized that is the, 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 you always get to the point where you meet people, isn't it? The role of people in conservation is, is serious, is important, and is always there. And uh, I didn't study biological sciences because I wanted to work with people, but I ended up getting more and more involved in, in finding out about it. If we look at uh, the, where we are at today, um, so from me doing these apprenticeships, after that we had real 92, and then we had the Convention on Biological Diversity, we had the Aishi targets, 
and uh, the decade on, on biodiversity, which ended this year. And a lot of the targets, well, we can say that the targets have not been reached and biodiversity is still in decline. And uh, that this loss of biodiversity is altering all the key processes which are important for all the productivity of uh, uh, and sustainability of, of ecosystems. And this affects uh, all the species and, and ourselves. Um, at the end of the decade of uh, biodiversity, we have, um, actually I can't, I wonder if, if you can all see because uh, you can see the people as well, isn't it? But I, I can read here. Um, so we, we have the World Wildlife Found Nature Living Planet 2020 telling us that amphibians, reptiles, birds, fish, mammals dropped 68% uh, since the 1970s. And this is still happening. So with all the efforts and all the conservation efforts that we've been putting into maintaining biodiversity and rescuing that, uh, there's still lots of problems. But uh, we know that remedies require urging, transformative actions such as restoring, reintroducing, and rewilding is part of it. And the recovery of uh, ecosystems depends on a combination of having areas that are large enough, connected enough uh, to sustain, um, to have self healthy, self-sustaining habitat, but also depend on the development of um, tolerant human communities, which can live alongside uh, wildlife. So when we talk about the return of native species, it is a very positive science. It is a very positive outlook into conservation. So initiatives to return species to their native roaming grounds appeal to people's need for a positive, proactive, inspiring response to the laws of biodiversity. For the public, reintroductions can represent an opportunity to make a positive impact within a world or negative stories regarding environmental degradation permeate the headlines. And uh, the other positive story is rewilding signifies a desire to rediscover the values of freedom, spontaneity, resilience, and wonder embodied in Europe's, not only Europe's, because you have rewilding in America as well, in Australia, uh, natural heritage, and to revitalize conservation as a positive future-oriented force. So when we think about uh, translocations for conservation purpose, they are defined by the IUCN as intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it has disappeared with the intention of reestablishing a viable population. Reintroductions are not easy to do. They are work intensive, they are very expensive. We are dealing with species uh, that have no, you cannot put a value to them because they are the last individuals uh, or populations within the species. And uh, so it requires a, a, a great integration and understanding about biology, ecology of species and biomes, and also about social political issues. But in some cases, is the best solution to increase the chances of survival of endangered species. So it is a management tool to increase biodiversity and ecosystems function, um, which benefits future generations. It gets high profile and it can also raise awareness about conservation of species and, and habitats. Within a framework of biodiversity conservation, you have, we have uh, the CBD obliged signatory countries, uh, the UK included, to adopt measures to recovery and rehabilitation of threatened species, including reintroduction, 
you have the same European com community habitats directives, uh, talking about the desirability of reintroducing species. And Aishi Strategic Goal C talks about improving the states of biodiversity, uh, safeguarding species, ecosystem species and diversity. Now, within that context, the IUCN talks about the need for um, public support in doing any of these initiatives of uh, bringing back species. Okay. So that's recognized as being something important. But what are the ecological and social economic consequences of uh, reintroduction then? We know increased biodiversity and ecosystem services benefits people on many levels and biodiversity is absolutely connected with uh, from provision of food, water and air to regulation of the quality of those and uh, the, the supporting systems from photosynthesis to soil and also cultural provisions. Though the idea of ecosystem services is, uh, we can discuss if it is something that's too uh, based on the, the, the idea of, of uh, catalyzing, uh, turning, um, leaving systems into uh, monetary values so that we can deal with uh, business. Um, it still, it illustrates that biodiversity is important for everything. Now, when we think about returning wildlife, we talk about individuals that will engage in ecological processes and affect other species, and that's what you expect. Uh, and they will affect populations and um, the structure of ecosystems. And some of these species that are affected and populations and ecosystems will be valued by people. And they will be used to doing things in a different way for a while, while that species have been absent. We have to think about people and, and uh, how this affects people's businesses and, and uh, uh, livelihoods, because reintroduction is rarely conducted in spaces that are totally devoid of people. Now, our relationship with wildlife is very complex, and it doesn't only involve conflict. The relationship evolved, so there are studies showing that there are inherited responses um, that were adaptive during co-evolution within communities that humans evolved with. And, uh, but a lot of our, uh, uh, um, the elements of our relationship with, with wildlife are passed on as culture. So they reflect in and shaping knowledge and beliefs and attitudes towards wildlife, wilderness, and certain species, and they can change. When we think about species that have been killed off, persecuted, uh, specifically that there are campaigns to destroy them, so we can expect that there are uh, strong emotions from diverse groups with diverse interests that might be playing when we plan to bring them back. And of course, uh, things will have changed while they've been away. So uh, we have to make sure if, that they are welcome and that there are protections in place and that uh, 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 the reintroduction effort can be successful. If we think about conflict between people and wildlife, conflict comes from territorial proximity and involves sometimes competition for the same resource. It can be competition for food or territory or the use of uh, certain spaces uh, that people want to use for recreation, but uh, uh, can, that, that can stop if uh, you introduce 
certain species to it. Um, they also involve damage to property and threats to well-being, predation, which includes attacks or disease, uh, and retaliation. They may also reflect conflicts between different groups of people. And this can be people who are struggling for power, uh, like for example, urban and rural divides, or conflicts over land use, or even political identity and, and personal uh, issues. Uh, we can say that the, any conflict between people and wildlife will affect the health and well-being of people and wildlife, or at least it can drive to that. Uh, it may affect economic interests and livelihoods and impact on long-term conservation goals. So if the conflict is between the conservation people and the local people, it would be much more difficult to secure protected areas and to build any support for conservation action. And that brings me to this study. So all these different concerns about um, the impact of uh, conservation on local people and local people on reintroduced species, we have put this, this uh, research together and it's been going on for a few years now uh, myself, as a conservation biologist, my colleagues Ana Fernandes, who is from uh, psychology, she is a social psychologist, and Alan Bainbridge. Alan is, um, he works with education and biography and narrative research. So we have different backgrounds, but the same interests. And that makes our work interdisciplinary and also using different methodologies. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. This is us in uh, me with a research student and a keeper in, in um, the Highlands Wildlife Park. Why large carnivores? The, this study was focused on large carnivores because they are catalysts for conservation of biodiversity. They are charismatic. They have key role in regulate, regulate, regulating sorry, ecosystem dynamics. Um, they inspire rich cultural and historical heritage. And uh, there are studies that show that there is a link between wild predators and enhanced biodiversity. And the fact that the absence of predators is connected to declines in biodiversity. Now, the conservation of large carnivores can be problematic and um, bring lots of different opinions, but it can only happen with support and involvement of local people because they use very large areas and uh, mostly landscapes are fragmented. So some of the areas will be protected and some of the areas will be private. Uh, protected areas are usually small. And uh, there might be conflicts of interests and people-people conflict that could influence any project called conservation of, of uh, large carnivores. And the project we put together in the UK involved the European lynx, which has been extinct uh, since the Middle Ages, so over a thousand years ago, uh, it went extinct on the 700s because of persecution, because of decline in forest areas and, and in prey. Um, but the studies have shown that there is enough quality habitat for the reintroduction of the lynx to the Scottish Highlands. So if you can see this map, uh, the green areas are the areas where there are pos uh, the possibility of good habitats and you can see the corridors in red as well. And uh, these areas have similar conditions to parts of Europe where the lynx remains, which you can see in the other, the big map, the red areas is where you can find lynx. So the reintroduction could help to restore ecosystems and benefit future generations by doing so. There's someone with the microphone on. Um, and could help the management of uh, 
of uh, smaller deer which have been eating away at the forests and have to there's a lot of money spent into uh, controlling them and so it would reduce grazing, pre grazing pressure and need for deer fencing. Of course, there are areas of concern. And uh, predation on livestock and game um, will probably be the most important ones, mostly because there are very large areas, uh, very few landowners owning enormous amount of land where they can keep birds and uh, deer for um, commercial hunting. So they are not actually helping a lot of the local community, just a few people. And, uh, but they would be suffering some losses if the lynx is reintroduced. We argue that you can actually have a, a, a much better investment of resources into ecotourism or um, small businesses which are lynx friendly and would bring more people and revitalize the communities in the areas. Th these are some of the issues that can come up. Uh, there is a, a worry about predation on rare wildlife like wildcats and capercaillie, which are uh, endangered birds as well. Um, people might fear about personal safety and my fear about that dispersal. So, so these are where the questions we wanted to investigate. We could guess that this could be areas of concern, but we had to talk to people to actually identify which areas are of real concern and how they could be addressed. The second focus species was the pine marten, which is in decline and they, um, over the years with the decline of forest, there are forest animals like the, the lynx. They have uh, retracted to areas in Scotland. You can see in the map where they still remain. There have been uh, reintroduction projects in, in parts of the UK, uh, Wales, and the beginning of reintroducing the north of England. But they are, uh, biodiversity uh, action plan priority species. And they're threatened from habitat loss and, and fragmentation and lost den sites. There was historical persecution as vermin. They are mustelids, so they will eat small animals and, and, and uh, eggs and, and birds. Uh, and they, their range declined. But they have a role in ecosystem dynamics and they've been found to be very good predators of the gray squirrels, which have been introduced. And so they could help the recovery of red squirrels, which are native. The conservation actions involve this concern for the reintrodu reintroduction of uh, pine martens into areas of suitable habitat. But again, we would have to uh, try and identify uh, which areas could be a problem. The other part of this research is interested in the role of zoos in developing a relationship between people and biodiversity. And uh, again, I've always been very interested in zoos and in the role they, they can have. We, we know by research that most people visit zoos to have a good day out with family and friends. And but once they are there, we're talking about 700 million visitors uh, or visits made to global zoos and aquariums each year. Once they are there, then there's a lot that can happen uh, and a lot of that can be positive. So zoos are catalysts for conservation. They contribute skills and expertise in animal care and husband, husbandry public engagement, education, and research, and we know that. They have a growing commitment to biodiversity conservation via the World Association of Zoos and Aquarius and, and localized um, organizations such as this. And they pledge to the Aishi biodiversity targets. The research has shown, I've, I've got a little, this little bo box here 
is uh, research from Andrew Moss and, um, and a group of colleagues, and actually shows that zoo visits correlate with small but significant increases in biodiversity related knowledge. So knowledge is one of the, the uh, uh, it can be, uh, can have a positive effect on knowledge. And, uh, and also it can have a positive effect on um, Aisha target one, so knowledge about biodiversity. And although the relationship is weak, they both predict self-reported biodiversity behaviors and that should continue after the visit as well. The knowledge seems to last over a reasonable length of time after the visit. So the behaviors, they increase with the visit, but stay the same, but the knowledge increases and uh, continues to increase after the visit. So th this is quite important if we think that we need help uh, for, uh, we need the support from the general public. Yeah? And then there is other research <coughs> looking about the development of connections and care for nature in the zoo. And I find that really elegant and beautiful. So uh, Susan Clayton and her colleagues says that, say that experiences of nature are a process socially facilitated or discouraged, mediated and interpreted. So the experiences we had as children in nature and the people who held our hands and took us and talked to us about nature and the clues that they gave us about, is it a good place to be? Are animals good? Are they scary? This stays with us. It forms the way we relate to wildlife and nature. The direct experiences of non-human animals provided by zoos have this power of providing a vivid, emotionally rich uh, experience that turns into a memory and turns into understanding about that species. And because our experiences are socially facilitated, in the zoo you have the social context because you are, you are sharing your experiences with people you value from friends to family. Um, and you share values with them as well. So this can have a very strong Long, this is why it can have a long, a long term effect on people. And it can actually, if that's followed by suggestions on how you can uh, have positive behaviors um, that will help that species from helping with funding to changing your habits, that can have a very positive uh, impact on biodiversity. So the justifications for our study in terms of researching attitudes, we uh, looking at carnivores as, as keystone species and um, the importance of understanding uh, the attitudes of varied sectors of society towards the species targeted by conservation and reintroduction as an essential part of planning uh, wildlife management strategies. So this understanding can bring an opportunity to engage the public, to understand the causes and effects of biodiversity loss, and to find in what's the best way to mitigate negative um, elements. And also researching the role of zoos is justified by how they are committed to biodiversity so they can support conservation and by the fact that uh, in the UK you have 24 million people visiting zoos uh, every year, so there's a lot of people to work with. And the methodology we used aimed to investigate attitudes, beliefs, and values towards biodiversity, the focus species, which were the lynx and the pine marten, and their conservation and reintroduction in the UK, to investigate how this relate to knowledge, social demographic uh, variables, so people's age, gender, uh, education, 
their life experiences and how far or how close they are to the reintroduction site so that they, they have they inhabit and uh, to investigate associations between all these and zoo membership to understand what kind of influence zoos can have on people's attitudes uh, towards biodiversity this research as i said was is cross-disciplinary, takes a cross-disciplinary approach because we look in from the perspectives of conservation biology, psycho social psychology, and also narratives, personal narratives, and combines quantitative questionnaires with qualitative focus groups and interviews. So that's where the social science comes. We completed phase one of the study, which was carrying out focus groups in the southeast of England, the Kent is part of the southeast, and in Scotland, uh, because they are very different, they have very different perspectives. Scotland has much more wildlife than, than Kent. Kent is close to London, is much more inhabited. And then we planned the second phase of the study to do a national large scale survey. And then things changed, as they do. Um, but I'll talk about that in a moment. First of all, I'll, I'll give you a, a general look at, at our findings, OK, from Kent and Scotland, the focus groups. So from talking to people about all these different issues, about the carnivores, about biodiversity, there was a general understanding about the role of reintroduction to restore ecosystem function and biodiversity. A lot of the time we think people don't get these ideas, but I think they understand more than we uh, guess. The, the word biodiversity is not well recognized, but what it means, the variety of life, people get it. And also the value and benefits of this variety of life to people. There there was a sense of sadness for the loss of species and also an excitement to know that they exist and that they can exist again. There was support for the reintroduction. People uh, believe that the animals have the right to be there, that the humans are responsible for their disappearance so that people own to the future generations to bring them back. There's a lot of concern about the world we leave into our children. And there were also barriers to uh, support for the reintroduction. And they had to do with fears and concerns for the safety and welfare of different groups of the species that were still around while these uh, species have been away or extinct, or locally extinct. What happens to the other species when, when this big predator comes back? Will they be affected? Will they suffer? There were concerns about the welfare of the reintroduced animals, if they were protected enough, if they were going to be persecuted. And there are concerns about livestock, livestock and pets. There are also concerns about people and their livelihoods for farmers and their families and for the local communities if they had um, business interests that could be affected. And also concern about people harming the reintroduced animals. Would they be protected enough? Would people uh, behave in a nice way? In relation to the zoos, their views were very interesting and varied. Some people felt that the zoos are places to reconnect with nature themselves. And that uh, familiarity, knowing the species, if you know it, you can love it. So the zoos create these opportunities for people to familiarize themselves with uh, these species or the, the, the folk species. But they also concerned that the familiarity can cause a loss of caution and that people will find that they are too chummy with with uh, and, and lose this understanding that we're talking about wild animals. They have their own um, 
predatory behaviors and so on and so forth. They all seen um, zoos as vehicles for education and conservation, where you create empathy for exotic animals. A lot of the time, native species are less well known. And that was a criticism, which was very interesting. Some people felt that zoos distort the picture and they can send the wrong message about um, ease of uh, reintroduction and conservation. Uh, and that would be counterproductive. And uh, 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 someone said, it doesn't seem like uh, looking at a wild animal. So it doesn't have any effect on my views of uh, when they are wild. So uh, people might detach the idea of seeing a captive animal and uh, uh, what means to, for uh, that animal to be in the wild and its needs and ecological needs and interactions. Um, some people had the very worrying view that zoos exist to protect the animals inside so that animals are being protected by being captive. So we identified a few areas where there are misconceptions that can be fixed by information. And we discovered several areas related to fear, so related to affect, to emotions, uh, that deserve another type of approach. So as I was saying before, bef um, as we were getting ourselves ready to do a national survey, uh, some serendipity happened because the, in the UK, we have this um, charity called the Wildlife Trusts that look, like, look after wildlife in the whole of Britain. And they have uh, local partners in different counties. So the Kent Wildlife Trust, the, the, the Wildlife Trust of the County of Kent, they started a project with uh, uh, Wildwood Trust, which was one of our partners, and it's a local zoo uh, specialized in native species. And the project is called Wilder Kent, and Wilder Bleen is a local forest. Um, and they want to do wilding, so. Um, they are aiming to create a greater abundance of wildlife by restoring natural processes, work together with partners across Kent to restore bigger areas of habitat for all to benefit, bring back species that have been lost and use their stories to connect more people to nature and promote the recovery as a way of keeping local people and our planet healthy. So their plan aligns so well with all the objectives of our plan that we have been working together. So uh, instead of doing this national survey, we are expanding the species we are looking into and uh, uh, making plans to, to look at the human dimensions of reintroductions in the Kent area. Let's see if I can show you a little bit of, uh, of this clip here, give you a better idea. Can you hear? You can you you don't you're not getting the sound. We're not seeing it. Gotcha. You can see it, but not list not hear. Neither see nor hear. Ah, okay. Um, so this is the the guy in charge of the Kent Wildlife Trust, and he's talking about the plans to rewild Kent. That first bird you saw is the red-billed chaff, which has been extinct in Kent for a long time. You have the heath fritillary butterfly, uh, which is also declining. And um, one of the ideas is to, is to bring large animals like the bison. Bison is not a local species, but it could uh, help to, to restore grasslands and, and uh, increase the biodiversity of the habitat. 
the chaff is being bred at Wildwood and some of the animals would come from other parts of the UK to try and connect populations between Kent and the South, or Cornwall, where they still exist. The, the other animals that are of interest here, I'll just move it forward, is uh, European beavers. They are a little bit different from the beavers in, in the US. And they have been released into these uh, fenced areas in Kent, but there are plans for a bigger reintroduction. Beavers also have disappeared over 500 years ago, but they are good um, uh, habitat engineers. Um, the idea is to bring back some of the favorite species and increase biodiversity as, as a whole. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let's see if I can move to the next one. Um, ah, okay. There is always some snag, isn't it? <laughs> oh. I'm trying to move to the next slide. <laughs> I might have to come out forward. Yeah, there you go. So these are all species that uh, have been uh, native except European bison. Uh, and some of them are part of this plan to return wildlife to Kent, yeah? Um, so I'll just talk a little bit before I, I go to the, the other story. Um, we are very excited about this project and I hope it will happen. We will be working together with Alistair Bath and Associates. Alistair is, is someone with a lot of experience working with uh, different interest groups in reintroduction and finding consensus between different interests and uh, identifying um, the, the difficulties and, uh, and key areas that need to be addressed. And so we are, we are to our plan together and we are hoping to develop that. So instead of working with uh, just with Lynx and the Pine Martin, we are hoping to look into starting with the red bill chaff and looking into the different species, creating our, our own uh, plan that can then be, be used by um, different reintroduction uh, locally. And that brings me to the work that I've been doing with other colleagues that, who are part of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Conservation Translocation Specialist Group. Um, and uh, everyone who's interested in human wildlife interactions and is working with conservation should get in touch with us. We are a resource for practitioners and researchers and students as well to address key issues concerning the relationship between people and wildlife in reintroduction programs. And the aim of the group is to promote discussions of key issues, help practitioners find solutions, support the IUCN and share resources. Um, this is some of us. And uh, we have a uh, presence in ResearchGate where you can find all the reports that we've done so far and on Facebook as well. So we've published a few things. These are the discussions we had with uh, members of the reintroduction community so far. And I'll just, um, to finish, just identify a few of this, all these key messages that we have been discussing we, we try to have two or three discussions a year and then uh, uh, write a report which we share with everyone who's interested 
and the report can be found on ResearchGate. And some of the issues that come up every time is about the importance of consulting local people before, during, and after the project is uh, initiated. And uh, also uh, planning the exit of the conservation project or reintroduction project, what's gonna happen afterwards. We discuss the role we have a research as researchers in that. There is a lot of discussion about understanding public perceptions, the need to listen to people. And uh, if we want to change people's behaviors, we need to also, pre first of all, have a conversation, have a relationship of trust with them. Um, we need to work with partners because reintroduction, again, is not only in protected areas, it has to uh, count on neighboring lands as well. And we should include coexistence as a part of, uh, as a reintroduction goal, because it's that important. We also have a lot of discussions about the need for accurate, reliable, regular information to locals. And that involves conversations about how do you inform, who is the best person to inform, what is the message, and um, the importance of public relations and support for our project and how to co-create this project with, uh, with local people. So if we are conservation biologists, Biology, what we know about conservation is not enough to slow down the loss of biodiversity. And we know that we have enough evidence for that. Education also is not enough. Knowledge is not enough on its own. So we need to strengthen our relationships with local people, to build a relationship of trust and dialogue between conservation initiatives and different groups with social scientists, with human dimensional professionals, uh, dimension professionals. Uh, so uh, it's a benefit to work with people across areas. And also we need to have funding that actually meets the needs of uh, intersection work like this or, or uh, cross-disciplinary work, which is still lacking. And um, zoos can help a lot with working emotions as well as knowledge and support for conservation. Um, it's a lot to take in, but uh, I'll leave you with uh, this last picture of the main dwarf. And uh, I'd like to say thank you very much and give it back to you, Aletris. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Wow, you covered a, a lot of information. Um, and I just want to open it up now to um, questions. And, and so people can either unmute themselves, ask a question. And if you prefer, you can type a question into the chat and I can read it off, um, whatever you prefer. But I just wanted to, to start. Um, you know, it, it seems like, and I think, you know, we know that, that working with people is often the key to successful reintroduction um, and in many ways. Um, yet, many conservationists never have any formal training in social science or communications or, you know, have anything on, on, you know, they go to school strictly to work with wildlife and, um, and then find themselves you know, thrown into these scenarios where really the key to our success is working with people. Um, and so, you know, what advice would you give to students and young practitioners that are finding themselves kind of between this rock and this hard place where they don't have any training to be successful, you know, to um, actually help conserve the species that they're devoting their lives and careers to? Yes. Absolutely, that's such a key problem and is a recurring one. It always comes up in discussions. And uh, it's, it's something that we need to find what is our role in, in addressing this kind of issues. And I think the, the, the most straightforward 
answer is work with social scientists. We can't be expected to have the same knowledge. It's like if someone asks uh, a social scientist, oh, can, can you do a, a habitat survey for me, please? You know, if you reverse the roles, no one's gonna learn that in, in a minute, isn't it? Yes. And if we can work together, you just advance much better. I have been working with it for um, almost 20 years now, since I started this study in 2004. I had to learn an awful lot to know what is in psychology that I need to know and to, to learn to listen and, and so on and so forth. But there are people who already work with that and, and is, you know, let's work together. Such a great point. I find so many uh, conservationists just, uh, you know, with, without really knowing, they're like, "Well, we'll just we'll just do a survey," <laughs> you know, and, then, and they you know, and then they don't get any results that can be used, and they don't understand the complexities of, you know, bias and you know so much that goes into your know, designing. It's not as simple as just designing a survey and getting you know answers. No. We, I think you, you have, as you said, we have, people have such good intentions in, in conservation. Enormously, uh, it is, is, comes from our heart, isn't it? It's is something that's so important to us. Doesn't mean that we know how to do it, how to, and, and also we go into it because maybe we don't like to work with people so much, we prefer animals, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And, it's a steep learning curve. It's very easy to ask the wrong questions, not to listen, and to bring an idea of conservation that's imposed. And then you create problems because people's back just go up, isn't it? So they, they don't want to listen to me. Why am I gonna help? Uh, what's the benefit for me? And, and so, yes, and we don't have the, if we ask the wrong questions, we cannot work with the answers, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. So, so if we work with human dimensions, with professionals, we get faster answers, more objective, and it cuts time and cuts co costs, and we can do our job and uh, get a better result. Mm. That's very good point. Yeah, I think yeah, there is there's a lot of um, naivety in in I think um, how complex it is and. Yeah, but forming those yes. collaborative teams, I really do feel is, is the key to, to successful projects, especially on a large scale. Uh, unfortunately, also, because I, I work with uh, sustainability and sustainability education, there is a, a very large uh, tradition of, uh, you know, the, the, the guy, the, the white guy coming into a, a biodiverse country in the third world, and saying, oh, this is wrong, and this is how you should do it. And we are stepping away from that. Uh, we just need to know how to do it better, isn't it? To listen to different voices, listen to different inputs, different cultural ideas and beliefs about nature. The way we've been treating nature is, is really not a good model. And there are lots of better models around indigenous knowledge, tradi traditional knowledge that can be very positive and add to what we, uh, any solutions in biodiversity conservation. Isn't it? Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, well, pioneers like you are leading in changing that model, uh, which is really exciting for us. Okay, I think um, Ashley has a, a question. Hi, I do have a question. Hi, Hello. Ashley. So um, I was kind of wondering, as um, a young researcher who recently graduated, we're not necessarily in that position of power to begin um, our own studies and working um, to make our sort of community-based science projects a reality, but we still have that sort of passion because we know just how important it is to really dig into the issues of human wildlife conflict in different areas and how it varies from different communities. But how would we as young researchers be able to begin those projects without having sort of like a larger job title or um, a large sort of, um, I guess, a corporation or an NGO sort of at our backs? 
Absolutely. So it's so exciting. Well done. Congratulations for <laughs> graduating and, and all that. It's exciting and it's overwhelming, isn't it? Volunteer. Look for a, uh, um, an area that you would like to work with, a region or a species, and start by volunteering. Then you're going to build up your professional knowledge, even if you're not being paid, you know, do another job to, to make money. But while you're volunteering, you're building professional knowledge with professionals, and then you can apply for a job after that, you know. The other way of doing is, of course, joining a research group within the university. Um, is not everyone can, can get in. Sometimes they don't offer what you are interested in, in doing. But that should never be a barrier, you know. You're gonna trade. You're gonna find your own way. As I was saying, the the things that happened in my life they came from different uh, places, and in the end, my skill set is varied, and no other person could do the research that I do, you know. So your experiences might look a bit strange and, and all, but they will adapt and give you your perspective, what you can bring into the profession. I think volunteering is always a, is a great way to start because it's a professional job, it's just not paid yeah, and builds curriculum. I hope it helps. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, someone else coming on the screen to ask another question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you, um, at your zoo doing all of your research, um, I'm sure you notice a lot of people just walk by some animals and spend not more than a couple seconds and say, oh, that's cool and move on to the next thing. Is there a type of strategy you notice that is best for reconnecting people to animals to kind of hold their gaze for more than a couple seconds, whether it be a really interactive sign or a cool display that catches your eye or mm -hmm. something to interact children a little more, or maybe it's the zookeepers coming out and actually talking to folks coming by. Is there a way to hold people's attention for more than just a couple seconds? That's a very good question. I think there are, there are studies uh, about it. One thing I didn't mention and I'll do now, there is one way of completely alienating people and, and making them hate conservation and zoos and everything which is have bad welfare in zoos, okay? So zoos can only do a positive job if they looked after the, after the welfare first. So if the enclosures uh, are, are, have good stimulation, um, they, they are based on the needs of, of the, the animal behavior needs and the ecological needs as much as you can do, if they are naturalistic, people will engage much more. If the animal doesn't look good or is doing stereotypic behavior, that's what people will remember, okay? So that's the no. <laughs> what I see uh, work is the storytelling. And if you have um, the keepers, you know the, 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 the sessions where the keeper uh, is feeding the animal and talking to people, I think that soul is very strong, you know, and answering questions and that uh, people can see the animal do things and they understand why the animal is doing that. I think uh, the, the possibility of uh, creating interaction is always very powerful, isn't it? But as the uh, Susan Clayton's work shows, it also depends on who you are with at the zoo. If you are with a teacher who is ex and will make the intermediate, uh, will be the intermediate between the animal and you, or a parent or a friend, that also helps the connection. They also show that if they have uh, people go around the zoo and if they have an interesting exhibit, okay, 
it, it's not might not be next to the animal, but uh, it's a nice exhibit with photos uh, and and good information and telling people what they can do to help the animal. That's also strong. So there are, there are a few things. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I like to ask a second question if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, no, while I'm no, here. I don't. Um, yeah, go for it. Um, I know a lot of zoos have like their African area or their South American area and they're trying to clump things into where they are regionally and I don't know if this is just something I've noticed and is completely wrong and I just haven't been to a lot of zoos but I feel like a lot of North American zoos that I've been to tend to lack those North American species they're emphasizing more of the cool big cats from all around the world or they have a very large um, African savanna display and they're not really honing in on the species that are here at home and so people want to conserve things that are far away from them and instead of trying to get back to what's at home is that kind of anything that you've noticed or maybe other people in your research have noticed and should zoos be focusing more on those um, native species to their area? This is funnily enough one of the focus of our uh, research because we're looking at zoos that specialize in native species and trying to compare with zoos where you have everything and they're much more based on uh, or focus on exotic species. Yeah? And this is a concern, it came up during the research that from very early on you learn about giraffes and lions and tigers, but you know much little about uh, uh, your own wildlife in your own background, uh, backyard, yeah? So I think this, this concern is not only in the US. It, it happens here, I am in, in the UK, I'm based in England. It happens here. Um, I think it, most people you talk to grew up with this idea of exotic species as being the, the big ones that everyone knows, yeah? And this has to change. If you want to create a relationship where people understand what their actions influence in terms of biodiversity, you have to start at home, yeah? Because um, you're gonna make, uh, you're gonna vote, you're gonna make decisions that will interfere with management and with protection of areas and with the policy of um, uh, species protections. And if you don't know about the species, you're not gonna care. So I think that's a, a serious point and every zoo should put a lot of effort into um, understanding and, and raising awareness about the local species that should be familiar. I, I completely agree with you. I think it's important. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. I think, um, let's see, Ivan has a question. Oh yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's raining cats and dogs here and hopefully you can hear me. I can, uh, thank you. Wonderful, thanks uh, so much for the presentation. Very insightful. Thank you, Ivan. I think there's a lot uh, that we can learn from uh, this, the, the research and the experiences uh, to enhance our work. So I'm called Eva, uh, Ivan Amani, and I work with the uh, Dian Fosse Gorilla Fund International. So we have programming in Rwanda and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I specifically take charge of uh, the people aspect of our conservation work. So sort of uh, helping uh, communities to see the value of uh, conserving gorillas, both in Rwanda and Congo. And so my question is, uh, from your experiences, uh, in a, wherever you've been doing this work, and, and uh, 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 the, the study that you conducted as well, can you advise on the policy angle, what sort of policy options or probably national level government actions uh, can help enhance the relationship between people and wildlife? Because in, in our instances, some of the gaps are at policy level and uh, 
no matter how much we do as a non-government uh, conservation agency, we will always find some hiccups here and there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ivan. You do such a fantastic job. You should be here talking as well. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll hear from you next time. Um, this is a, a big issue, isn't it? Because when you are planning reintroduction, you is is government is you have several institutions working together, isn't it? You might have a university or research organization, the government, and maybe other partners. And uh, it, the the relationship has to be established from the beginning, from the planning, and actually before the planning. One of the things that uh, the, the human dimensions. Uh, of uh, wildlife conservation tries to get is people sitting together from each interest group to try and understand what are, what do they need, what do they want to achieve, and uh, what are the key problems that they have, okay? Um, I would say that, that everyone needs to sit together from the different interest groups, including local leaderships, which might be um, chieftains, or it might be religious, it might be uh, social groups, but you have to have the locals, the government, and the research bodies having conversations, and then the plan has to come from that, isn't it? But everything needs to be written down so that it doesn't change. Because one of the frustrations is what you're saying, isn't it? And then uh, five years on, one of the funders, uh, the funding is taken away or the government changes and then the plans will change. If you have everything agreed and written down from the beginning, it's something to start with, isn't it? But I would, you I would invite you to join our uh, working group. Uh, if you want to send me an email, I, I will add you to, to our mailing list, okay? That's the kind of discussion that we can have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, Great question. Yeah, and thank you for the work you do on gorillas. Thank you. Oh, oh, let's see, we have another question um, from Cheyenne, a, a wonderful colleague, and she asks, uh, how do you perceive the use of social media platforms as a tool in educating and campaigning about conservation and biodiversity currently and its potential going forward? Mm. Well, absolutely. I think we cannot ignore the the, the the reach of social media platforms. But I must say, me and my group were very bad at it. <laughs> we feel a bit like dinosaurs. I, I avoid uh, social media. And so um, actually at university is fantastic because we've got, uh, uh, one of my colleagues works in communication within sustainability, education for sustainability. So I've got a, a, uh, someone who works with communication and her work is with students. They have podcasts, they have uh, blogs, they have all sorts of cool things that they do. And uh, so it's fantastic that we have people who, who come with that kind of knowledge because of course the reach, especially if we want to reach people all over the place and students and, and the younger, um, generations, let's say. It is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not the best person to talk about it, but I make the point of working with people who can do it. And I think you, you may have things to say about it that I, I probably don't know. No, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I think, um, you know, so many of the leaders in this front have been, you know, um, volunteers, interns, um, you know, students, working with us and you know really bringing that forward so I think in so many ways to kind of get back to your previous statement um, with Ashley Storms was to uh, you know it's an opportunity to get your foot in the door and you know provide something volunteer with an organization 
and then um, you know demonstrate your capabilities and then branch out in other directions. So um, you know, I think that you know there's there's a lot of potential there. And it's you know it's surprising what people grab onto. Um, but in my experience, you know, anytime you can provide that awe factor, which you were talking about at the zoo, where you can transform, you know, just looking at something into a memory, into a feeling, into an emotion, um, then you know I think then we've grabbed them and we've brought them. You know, then they think that that animal is has some importance or it has a. You know, um, you know, emotional connection to them, and then they're much more likely to then um, conserve it. So, uh, yeah, I think you're right. It, it, it is very powerful. We there is a lot of uh, belief that the the education is is the solution to everything. Education based on knowledge is not. Yeah. We know so much. We have um, access to so much information all the time isn't it? It's hard to focus on one thing. There's always a lot of information coming. It's not enough. We know that the social and the emotional have very, uh, is, a, is a combination, isn't it? Uh, of good information and the social context and the emotional engagement. It's very, and then it, it becomes powerful. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one more uh, question that I have, um, just asking about the difference in perceptions between species that naturally kind of recolonize an area and come back on their own and um, species that are kind of brought back in and reintroduced, if you wouldn't mind just briefly touching on that. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> tricky. Yeah. A whole different talk. <laughs> I, I can talk about a, a few things. Uh, so there is always discussion about um, species that have been introduced like people by mistake, uh, uh, you know, human, um, what, what's the word for it? Anyway, uh, in the species or kind of, yeah, so like, uh, let's say the gray squirrels in, in England, yeah, is not an easy discussion because they are cute. People don't want to, to kill squirrels, all right? They come and eat your sandwich and things like that, but they are not native and they interfere with, they, they can, it's not so much competition, but uh, they, they carry a virus which uh, can, can kill the red squirrels, but they, they only transmit that. So that's one issue of eliminating non-natives to uh, give a chance to, to natives. Yeah? The other issue is about reintroduction when species like um, the wild boar, the beaver, they were native, but they have been absent for a long time here in the UK, let's say. Um, so if they reappear, they're not considered native anymore. They, they have a funny status. Uh, they are not, necessarily exotic, but they are not native. So any initiative to introduce them is not, if it doesn't go through government procedure is illegal. So you can kill them wherever they are as a non-native species. Any reintroduction of species that were native, but have been absent for a long time, they have to be done within enclosed areas and complete, with completely complete control. What happens is some of them escape. And uh, the case of the beaver is we had several of these uh, enclosed um, programs, breeding programs happening. There is one in Scotland, there are two in England, uh, maybe more. And apparently the beavers keep escaping, you know, and they've been spotted in rivers here and there. Um, there is always the danger that some people will take the initiative to release, and then people can, uh, uh, in the in the hope that people will catch up with it eventually. So there are lots of gray areas there. No objective response. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting area, though. Uh, that being said, the beaver was just, a, the, the status of the beaver changed last year. 
because of efforts in Scotland. So in Scotland, they are now considered native uh, only because of the reintroductions, okay? Because this is an island, they are not going to recolonize, no animals are going to recolonize unless they are brought by accident or intentional reintroductions. Uh, but it's not easy at all. I don't know, did I answer your, your question? Yeah. yeah. Any other last minute questions? Yeah. Yeah. Lots, there's lots of gray areas. As you point, um, as with uh, you know, everything in conservation, that's, everything's on a continuum. Um, okay. Well, I think um, if there aren't any many any last minute questions. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you so much for staying on with us for so long. I really appreciate it. Um, if you could please just join me in kind of, you know, clapping or, you know, um, showing uh, some support um, in thanking you for your wonderful presentation. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that this talk has been recorded. And it will be posted on the Conservation Catalyst website, which is conservationcatalyst.com. And if you would like to review it or share this information with your friends or colleagues. And um, also, if anyone would like to nominate themselves or someone else to talk, and we do have a few slots open for next year. So please contact me. Our next presentation is um, going to be next year and Wednesday, the 6th of January, so the first Wednesday of every month, uh, 2021. And it'll be Dr. Sharma talking about understanding the drivers of human wildlife conflict and its mitigation pressures. So it should be really interesting. Um, and um, so thank you again. This really has been the breadth of, of knowledge and information that you shared. Um, has, has been really remarkable. And I, you know, I loved how your case study from the UK is so applicable to you know, us working you know, all over the world. Um, and so you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you very much, Alatris. I've, I've put the references uh, about the, the different works so people can access if they are in the, in, in the slides. And I just want to say uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, don't, uh, you know, people who are starting and uh, becoming researchers or interested in conservation, don't lose your heart. It is a wonderful um, area for your whole life. You have a, a lifetime of, of work to do. It is a necessary work. Everyone will gain for it, from it, from you doing what you do. And you can do that from your house, in your neighborhood, in the, the green areas near you with your own life choices and you can do that professionally and uh, all your experiences will add up and you'll be able to uh, put your own stamp into it hopefully so good luck everyone stay well thank you and and you know and thank you for uh doing so much to promote you know women um, in this field too and, and diversity you know i feel like each of us needs to bring up, you know, um, you know particularly young women in, in this field, uh, you know, uh, so that we can increase the diversity within conservation biology if, if we are to have any chance of preserving you know, global biodiversity as well. Absolutely, there is a lot of space for for different types of management styles and uh, uh, different layers of. Uh, of influence, and I think we, we can add a lot to it, young girls. Yes, yes, yes thank you. <laughs> and um, so on behalf of Conservation Catalyst, I just want to um, wish everyone um, very happy holidays and to both you and your loved ones, and um, best, best wishes for the new year, um, both for humanity and for wildlife worldwide. So um, thank you so much again for, for being with us in that incredible presentation. And I look forward to seeing the collaboration that stems from um, your presentation and your exceptional work. So thank you, everyone. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone.